Priyanka, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, our first main afternoon session for today. Um, this session, hopefully you've entered the right one, is focused on integrating homelessness, mental health and substance misuse services. I think um, a lot of our reflections um, for the past year and, and moving forward um, have been about the nature of the partnership approach that we've taken during the pandemic and the need for a multi-agency and cross-sector approach as we look to transform homelessness services in the future with an aim to ending homelessness in Wales. As we entered the pandemic, we knew it would be incredibly difficult to keep people safe, particularly those who didn't have a home um, or people who were experiencing co-occurring mental health and substance misuse, um, misuse issues alongside homelessness. Um, and actually a year ago today, I was sat in a room in Cymorth Cymru office, um, working alongside uh, Welsh government officials from the homelessness department, uh, directorate within Welsh government, but also from uh, the mental health and substance misuse team within Welsh government. And together we were talking about how we could take an integrated approach to uh, supporting people through this really challenging time, making sure that people continue to have the support that they needed, um, that people who relied on substances um, would be able to uh, continue safely, that we're able to provide that harm reduction uh, approach uh, to supporting people through this really challenging time. And I think what we've seen across the length and breadth of Wales is uh, partners coming together um, probably better than they've ever done really um, to try and make sure that there was that integrated approach. I think people recognise that it would be really hard to keep people safe if they didn't have a roof over their head but that that wouldn't succeed if they didn't have the multi-agency multi support wrapped around them and I think that lots of the things that have maybe been accelerated, particularly from a substance misuse perspective, like the use of Bouvidol, um, have meant that people could keep much safer than they may have been able to um, if, if they uh, hadn't had access to that. Um, and, you know, I can only really uh, praise uh, the fantastic efforts um, of, of colleagues across the sector, um, both strategically and making sure that that support was there for partnerships to happen, um, but absolutely importantly on the ground, um, to make sure that um, to make sure that you know people got the support that they need in the way that they needed it, um, and we certainly you know we're seeing thousands of people who've been brought into emergency accommodation, um, who've got those co-occurring complex needs, um, who um, who need to have that multi-agency support in order to sustain that accommodation, um, and need to have that multi-agency support going forward in order to ensure that people uh, can avoid a return to the streets, can continue to access the support that they need and can continue to have um, a roof over their heads. So today's session is, is all about trying to make sure that we continue to build on um, the massive strides that we've made during the pandemic and make sure that um, this isn't just something that happened because of a crisis, um, that it's, it's actually something that um, we take forward into the future that's meaningful, that's sustained, um, that doesn't happen just because uh, there's some passionate individuals making things happen, um, but actually um, it's systemic, that it becomes embedded in our systems, it come, it, it's embedded in you know, our approach to policy, our approach to strategy, and that, that filters down into, um, into the ground really, and that workers feel empowered uh, to provide that support um, to people in the holistic multi-agency um, approach um, that we need. Um, I'm really delighted uh, today that um, we uh, we have um, with us today um, a couple of uh, people from North Wales. So uh, really pleased that we've got Graham Boyle and Ed Gallagher, who um, are from the harm reduction service up in North Wales, who um, I think them and their colleagues have taken a, a really kind of integrated approach. Um, a really integrated approach to making sure that people have got the support that they needed during this time and it'll be really interesting um, to hear from them uh, about their perspectives um, on what's worked, uh, what the challenges have been, what, what their hopes for the future are. Um, and we're also uh, hoping to hear from um, Tracy Brahini from uh, Welsh Government. Um, Tracy's Deputy Director of Mental Health, uh, Substance Misuse and uh, Vulnerable Groups in uh, Welsh Government. Um, and I know um, that she's been a passionate advocate 
of uh, an integrated approach on a national level, uh, making sure that um, mental health and substance misuse services um, are working in partnership with homelessness services. I know that um, that work started in train, you know, long before the pandemic through the inclusion of homelessness and housing first in things like um, things like the uh, mental health delivery plan, the substance misuse delivery plan, and um, that, that that has continued during the pandemic, particularly I think in the phase two funding. Um, where I know that Tracy and her team were involved in looking at the phase two bids and, um, you know, have supported that multi-agency approach that we've seen. Um, so, um, so um, delighted uh, to be touching on this really important subject. It's absolutely at the, at the heart of um, transforming services. Um, I think we're having a bit of trouble uh, getting uh, Tracy on the platform. So uh, what we're going to do, sorry, Graham and Ed, but we're going to um, switch the order around and um, I'll stop uh, rambling on, which you many of you may have noticed that I've been doing. Um, and we'll head first to uh, Graham and to Ed. Um, so uh, if we could uh, potentially go to the uh, go to Graham and Ed and welcome you uh, to this session um, to share your learning and your experiences from uh, the North Wales Harm Reduction Service um, and then hopefully we'll have Tracy on board um, as we get further on to the session. Please utilise the Q&A section on the Hoover site um, and submit your questions um, and we'll come back to those um, once we've heard the presentation. So uh, welcome to Ed and Graham, thanks so much for making the time to be here today. We're really really looking forward to hearing about the approach that you've taken in the North so uh, please take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, can you hear me there, Katie? Yeah, brilliant. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Graham Boyle. I'm the uh, line manager for the harm reduction team in North Wales. So what I thought I'd um, speak to you about initially was a little bit of um, historical uh, information about the uh, harm reduction team, how it was set up with the intentions that it was um, initially set up for NSP and safer injecting and drug um, advice and yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, um, so the harm reduction team, um, as I mentioned, is set up across North Wales. So we cover um, Flintshire, Wrexham, Denbyshire and um, Gwynedd and Anglesey. Um, it was initially set up in 2000 and the remit was um, to provide safe uh, needle syringe provision and um, safe injecting advice as well as other uh, drug use advice. Um, in order to provide that, we employed um, some specialist uh, drug outreach workers um, who we sourced from other areas who were experts in the field. Um, so we positioned one of those in each area and uh, we provided support workers to assist them in those tasks. Um, the team are specialist outreach workers. They they Across North Wales, we have three outreach vehicles, and they tend to be um, they tend to be camper vans, and um, they're very anonymous. You wouldn't know them unless you knew what you were looking for. And um, they go out and um, engage service users on a daily basis, really. And we try to um, do that on the basis of uh, it's intelligence driven. So we look at hotspots where support is required and we'll, we'll target those areas. Um, we normally do it a couple of months at a time and then um, we'll move on depending on the information that we're given from uh, various agencies such as uh, local councils and um, police. Um, so initially we had a team of approximately 15 people including our bloodborne virus uh, nurses um, that has now expanded considerably. Um, we're into the uh, low twenties now with our new team members. Um, so that was born out of um, in 2017 up in Wrexham. There was identified that due to issues, um, probably one of the the better known issues being the use of um, spice, which many of you may well be aware of. Uh, it's quite widely. Um, quite widely reported in the local um, media. So there was the need from the assertive outreach team in Wrexham was identified and that was put together um, with the harm reduction team playing a pivotal role in that. Um, the 
essentially they the it was identified that we need to just stop reliance upon buildings essentially for our service users to be attend to come into us in buildings and for us to go out and um outreach to them really and provide services to them um ensuring that it was an easy to access service uh with the with the view of providing initial advice and then signposting onwards um, on the back of that, there was um, the crisis hub was set up, um, which was initially going to be a 12 month um, project in Wrexham, which um, actually was extended to be an 18 month project. That um, was a wraparound service for homeless people to um, come and access the uh, hub on a weekly basis. Um, and in that hub, um, there was multi-agencies um, we had mental health teams there was a gp um, there was the uh, district nurses the harm reduction team but as well as that we looked at people such as probation as well and um, it was extremely successful however due to covid that um, that came to a, an end uh, hopefully that will reopen again um, however on the back of that the collaborative, the collaborative outreach team was um, was born, and um, it was identified really that we needed a single point of access in the areas. And um, on the back of that, the coordinators became the single point of access. So now we have um, what is termed as the collaborative outreach team. So that is essentially the harm reduction team um, with extra capacity. Um, to be able to tackle uh, substance misuse and homelessness um, from a with a social lens, if you like, so that we look at everything from a biopsychosocial perspective, um, in that we understand that people are homeless, um, but there's always a reason, and our key objective is to identify what those reasons are and to provide support to be able to overcome those issues that people may be experiencing. Um, our teams now consist of the coordinators who have an overarching view of, um, of what's going on in their area. But um, the key to this is now we've expanded. So we have a mental health wellbeing um, support worker and we also have a, a homeless support worker um, uh, who deals with any um, housing issues. Um, and what we're finding is that we've been extremely successful in short interventions that have really um, shown great results in um, preventing further homelessness and being able to um, support people to maintain their tenancy and part of this is identifying um, where there's potentially issues arising that may cause the um, service users to lose the tenancy and how we can provide that support to be able to prevent it going any further. Um, Ed, I'm sure, will um, provide you with some examples of that some of the excellent work his team have been carrying out over in Gwynedd. Um, so, for us, um, some of the difficulties, obviously, probably nobody needs this pointing out, but setting up a new team uh, during the global pandemic has been difficult. However, um, since it's probably, it's, it's been, it has had some real benefits. The benefit, um, one of the main benefits, obviously, is um, the housing of homeless people. Um, and it has progressed things well for us in that we've been able to engage people that um, we would normally have really struggled to access. Um, so that's, and that, that's been one real benefit from COVID. On top of that, um, we also provide a bloodborne virus service, um, which, we've, um, which we've been able to get into some of the new um, homeless facilities in order to um, provide testing for hepatitis B, hep C and HIV. And um, 
that's proved really successful in getting people onto treatment normally within a week of detection of those of uh, well primarily hep c um so looking at how that was traditionally where you're looking at six to eight months to get people into treatment it's now down to a week so again covid has provided a real benefit uh, with regards to bloodborne viruses um i think i think just to summarize um from my perspective um the key to our service now is it's a wraparound service um certainly in terms of um being able to provide easy access support to service users and um keeping them engaged until such time as they feel ready or able to be able to engage with other um agencies such as um our colleagues in the substance misuse services. Um, and my, the team have been extremely successful in this. I, I, I'd echo Katie's point from earlier, really. Um, some of the work that's been done has been outstanding and um, in truly difficult circumstances. Um, I think, you know, it, it's probably one of the first times since I've been working for the NHS that um, things have been so collaborative and um, our partner agencies have been excellent um, in terms of overcoming some of the issues. Um, we all have different ways of working at the moment in COVID. Some of the, the challenges have been um, being able to get out and outreach, different um, risk assessments, um, which our agents, other agencies don't work in the same ways. That's been a major challenge providing support out there. Um, however, everybody has come together and um, we've been able to provide a service throughout um, the COVID period. And um, I'm, re I'm really proud of our team and the work they've been doing. And hopefully as we move forward in the future, this will just continue um, with uh, a view to um, expanding the team and being able to um, overcome people's homelessness issues um, and then supporting them to be able to hopefully move forward. Um, I'll hand over to Ed now. Ed is, um, I'm sure he'll introduce himself shortly. Um, he will, he's our coordinator from Gwynedd and Anglesey. Um, he'll give you some perspective as to the challenges on the ground um, that he's, um, he's uh, come across uh, since he's been in post. Um, so Ed, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah excellent. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so what does it look like on the ground for us and the team? Well, over in the West, <clears throat> as Graham's already alluded to, uh, I'm the coordinator. Um, so, oh, sorry, bear with me. There we go. Hello, good afternoon everyone. So I'm the coordinator. I've got um, the uh, original harm reduction team that was in place and they are uh, still in post. Um, but as part of the new team, there's myself as the coordinator and I have a mental wellbeing uh, outreach support worker. Um, we're lucky enough to have a very talented young man from uh, KAIS, who's one of our partner agencies. They are, um, they've supplied the um, outreach, the homeless and outreach support worker on the back of the Welsh Government Phase 2 funding for COVID. Um, and we're also incredibly lucky to have three workers from our partner agency at the Gatrev, um, who are part of the collaborative approach over here in the West. Um, my colleagues in Centre and East also partner with the Wallach, who provides a similar service over there. So when I got asked to be involved in this presentation, I was talking, thinking about the positives and the negatives or the challenges, we don't call them negatives, do we? Uh, the challenges that we, we were having um, as a team. And I think there's some obvious challenges, but as I reflected on them a bit more, the actual there's only actually three challenges that we had setting up the team or in my, as we started the process and we started the ball rolling. Because um, every other challenge everybody's having at the moment. So there's nothing new to the collaborative approach. Uh, one of the challenges we had um, which we discovered early on was that everybody was using different platforms for having these t these type of meetings. So that was an interesting one to overcome, especially as we ended up, um, especially as we ended up um, 
not having the right IT from BCU at the beginning because BCUs are very big machines. That was one of the challenges that we ended up having to overcome. And one of the last challenges we had, which was more of, um, it was sometimes people are a little bit adverse to change. So we had to integrate people into the team in a way that enabled them to come along with us and understand what the team was all about. But for me as a coordinator, the positives far outweighed any of the challenges. So the massive positive for us, particularly for those of us that were working for BCU or a part of Betsy Card Wallader, was the collaborative approach of working with these partner agencies because this service is new to the harm reduction team. It's a new service that they've never done before, but these agencies have been in place for many years and they have a wealth of experience and expertise that they could bring to the table. They could identify pathways into services that we maybe hadn't even thought of. Um, particularly our partner agency over here in the West, like Degatrif, um, have many, many little projects going on that I wasn't aware of. So as we're discussing referrals on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the team at Degatrev were fabulous and they could pick it up and go, actually, have you thought of this? Or have we tried this? Or have you spoken to so-and-so? And what that's done is enabled me to grow my knowledge base to be able to access some of these services. What it's also allowed us to do, and this has become really obvious, is to become very flexible in the way we approach individual cases and individual service users. I'll give you an example of that. We've, we've got a, a case at the moment. Um, we'll call her Kim for argument's sake. She is um, very challenging. She has serious mental health issues. She's a paranoid schizophrenic. And uh, the only person that can really work with her is her support worker from the Wallach. Um, he's doing an incredible job with her because she is so challenging. He referred her into us back in December. We still haven't got any engagement with her because of her fear of new people. But the worker in the Wallach is doing really, really well. So what we've been able to do is rather than offer her direct support, is we have put a package together to support the support worker. So we're able to work really closely with this gentleman to help Kim so he can access new services, we, even if it's just a bounce ideas off us. So we put a plan together for this lady. And as it turns out, what we've managed to do is get her re-engaged with community mental health teams. And she's now got the same work as she had four years ago. So she now trusts her. And we're starting to move forward with baby steps because we've been able to support this support worker in his work with her. So being able to do that plugs those gaps. And that's essentially what I feel we do is we plug the holes that are sometimes left from other services. So when we go back to talking about some of these challenges, obviously COVID has been a massive challenge. Graham's already alluded to that. Um, and it's made things very difficult. And everybody's, I'm sure we're all finding some people are use finding COVID as a good excuse not to do things. But I think what we've done is we've embraced COVID and said, look, it's here. It's, it's how we're going to have to work. We just have to deal with it. And we become more flexible. And what we're seeing is a lot of different ways of doing stuff. There's some really good innovative ways coming out from other services that can really help people. Again, I'll give you an example. Uh, we've got a fabulous um, provision here in Bangor at Penryn House. I think they're called the North Wales Recovery Community. Um, Penryn House is run by a chap who's just arguably one of the most infectious characters you'll ever come across, deeply passionate about his work in the recovery sector. And when COVID hit, they had to keep doing their recovery program. So what did they do? They built an outdoor space, obviously. And when he told me about his outdoor space, I'd pictured some sort of gazebo. Um, as it turns out, four of his residents at the time were trained joiners. One of them had a former building company. And for a fraction of the cost, and in three weeks, they built what can only be described as a Swiss chalet that was designed to house up to 20 people safely and be able to do these outdoor sessions with ventilation, social distancing in place, everything like that. So right throughout this pandemic, they've still been able to offer help and support to people that badly need it. We're also seeing a lot of innovation when it comes to um, technology. We've come across a really fabulous app at the moment called Dalio. So one of our providers up here called ICANN is doing a referral process where you can refer into them. They will link you to the app and the app is all about, um, about filling out and learning about your moods. So you can record your moods throughout the day 
and the support worker from ICANN will contact you as a consultant, will contact you, and it offers a real targeted approach to supporting you with your mental health. So they'll be able to look at the plan and the diary that you keep over your mental health and say, I can see at three o'clock on Monday afternoon, you are feeling a bit low. Shall we talk about that? How can we help you with that? And it offers a real targeted approach to mental health rather than missing out on the details. So there have been loads of challenges. Yes, we get that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are noticing an increase in conflict in HMOs in housing at the moment. Housing providers, particularly the housing teams and councils, are fighting fires at the moment because they're having to move people around all over the place. There's a huge shortage of housing. That's a national problem. We know that. Um, but what we are seeing is programs and projects like this really, really working. I'm so proud of the team that I have here. They are incredibly good at what they do. They are all experts in what they do. Um, and that is what's made this team work in that we can, we can get hold of all of this information, we can get hold of this knowledge and we can really build a care plan around the service user that's individual to them and they understand it. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm very lucky to be part of this team and I really enjoy it. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, both. It, really fantastic to hear that passion coming through and the real feasible benefits that come through when there is that genuine partnership working where you can learn from each other's perspectives. You know, what you were saying about learning from Degachev and the ex expertise that they have. And, and I'm sure that they would say the same about working with your team, vice versa. Um, so it's really great to hear how it's been working on the ground in North Wales. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. And I'm really excited to see, you know, what happens moving into the future where maybe we're out of the crisis kind of pandemic phase and we can actually build on some of these newly formed relationships and, and try and make sure that this is embedded in systems um, uh, as well as the passionate individuals such as such as yourselves taking it forward. So thanks so much, Graham and Ed. Um, so uh, I'm absolutely delighted that we've uh, managed to uh, get in touch with Tracy. She has persevered, absolute hero, um, and managed to get through uh, on the phone to the session. So as I said in my introduction, um, Tracy is is a Deputy Director for Mental Health, Substance Misuse and Vulnerable Groups within Welsh Government. Um, my experience of working with her over the past three or so years is that she's been determined to drive integration at a strategic level between homelessness, mental health and substance misuse issues. So long before the pandemic, she was an advocate of closer working and has made sure that homelessness and housing is reflected in mental health and substance misuse delivery plans over the past couple of years and has been key to making sure that some of the services delivered through phase two have had that mental health and substance use input. So I'm really delighted um, that she could join us today and to give an overview of her perspective on integration between homelessness, mental health and substance misuse services. Um, so welcome Tracy um, and I'll hand over to you uh, to give your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Tracy, I don't think we can. Oh, can can yes. you hear me now, Katie? Can hear you Brilliant. now. Fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, dear Katie and Prinhoundar, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry that, that my IT has, has kind of failed my end and I've been unable to get through on the various other platforms. But um, I did want to, I'm just so pleased to be part of the, uh, the kind of conference today. And in a way, the fact that my bit of this is shortened is, is, is no bad thing. I was just catching the tail end of the previous speaker. And it's more important, really, isn't it, to hear from um, you know, people who are at the front front um, front line on this. And Pen, uh, Penryn House, actually, um, I visited, so I know what a what brilliant work they do there in North Wales, um, in in that facility, and what a beautiful part of the country it's in. So, um, just just you know, listening to that previous speaker was 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 really um, you know, it's really inspirational. So, just to kind of um, uh, run through, I know you've got some slides. Um, Katie, that are being kind of controlled, I think, your, your end. Um, so, so we can skip through, really, 
on to the second slide, I think, which is uh, kind of the last, covering the last year. But I think the focus of what I wanted to say today was just to reinforce the Welsh Government's ongoing commitment to um, this, a more joined up approach across substance misuse, mental health and housing services. Um, and I also wanted to touch as we go through um, and update you on some of the work that we've done in this area um, during the last 12 months. So I'm on slide two, my end. Um, and just to say um, that, you know, with the onset of the pandemic, um, you know, we were really clear um, that, that we wanted to support those most vulnerable, um, you know, particularly the homeless population and also those struggling with substance misuse on, and or mental health problems. I think, Kate, you've heard, you've heard me say this, I know, uh, numerous times. I think we were all very worried um, back in March um, in that emergency situation that, you know, this was a group of people who could very easily have been forgotten about or deprioritised. Um, but, but thanks really to the efforts of everyone involved, but particularly those in the third sector, um, uh, um, these individuals have not been forgotten in the way that there could have been a, a risk that they, they, they would have been. And, and personally, I'm just really proud of the way that people who were working in those third sector agencies came together and, and made that that happen. Um, so I think most people will, will, will be aware of the statistics around the December 2020 statistics which indicated that we were able to accommodate up to around 6,000 individuals in various settings. Uh, and I suppose the bit that my teams, where my teams come in, is that it was really critical, however, not just to accommodate those individuals, but to provide the really necessary wraparound substance misuse or mental health support um, that they they needed so that they could be properly supported during what was obviously a very challenging time. I know it was very challenging for, 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 for those providing the services on the front line, particularly when we're talking about people who obviously have um, had chaotic lifestyles or who are difficult um, to engage. Um, we also knew uh, that there was a need to move very, very quickly at that time. And I just wanted to say that the level of commitment from services to work together collaboratively um, has been brilliant. And, and I would just like to thank everyone really for the, for the contribution as part of that. So moving on, I'm on slide three, Gwyn. Uh, I think Gwyn's controlling them. Um, uh, and I just wanted to cover here some of the developments that we put in place during the last um, year. So I think, as many people on this call will know, um, uh, we introduced um, Bouvidal um, as an option quite early on, and that represented an important change, really, in, administrative, in, in administering opiate substitute treatment across Wales. So we've got approximately 600 people now engaging on this programme, and um, we've provided a financial commitment for the next 12 months from the Welsh Government. As a result, it's estimated that around um, 1,000 individuals will be benefiting from Bouvidal um, support at, at, this, at this time. Um, obviously, that was done for a variety um, of reasons, primarily, obviously, to, to reduce pressure and footfall um, on, on the NHS pharmacy services, but actually, I should, uh, more primarily, um, to support those individuals concerned. And the um, initial feedback from service users has been really positive. Um, I'll be interested after the conference to have some feedback from, from people um, on, on this call, um, but certainly our service user feedback has been, has been very positive. Uh, but of course, we have commissioned um, an evaluation to inform any future activity in this space. And that's really important because of the fact that Bouvidal is such an expensive um, provision, really. Um, but it very much links into the expansion that we want to see in the development of rapid prescribing services across substance misuse services. So way back in, in March, which actually does feel like a lifetime ago now, um, along with our housing colleagues and the housing sector, we jointly issued guidance um, uh, to, to support really those that needed to um, 
uh, protect themselves during the pandemic and guidance really for the type of wraparound support that we knew would need to be provided. Um, as Katie has said at the beginning, we're really committed to um, building on that and continuing that um, as we move forward. Um, another kind of, I think I heard uh, a colleague talk about digital um, delivery just, just, just now. So another development during this last year has been the investment that we've made additional investment in digital technology for service users to engage in services and £300,000 was provided um, for that, for third sector partners to enhance their capability to deliver on digital platforms. So I'm on slide four. Uh, and speaking as fast as I, as I possibly can. Um, and this slide is just a summary, really, of um, the numbers uh, that we were able to help during that period, thanks to, to kind of third sector primarily, as I said, and the Area Planning Board and other partners. Um, so I suppose what I wanted to just pick up as part of this slide, though, is just to acknowledge that the getting the service delivery right um, remains a challenge, I think, um, because, you know, as part of the original cohort, um, we had 800 referrals generated for substance misuse services, uh, but only half of those actually um, came forward um, for, for the help that we knew that was needed. So it's, it's really, the um, fact remains really that there is still a significant element of the rough sleeping population that are choosing not to engage in services and therefore um, you know, we're, we're very clear that obviously that's, a, uh, that's something that we need to continue to work with partners um, or, or on really. So I'm moving on to um, slide five uh, which is around integrated working and I, and I guess I think Katie's touched on this. Um, you know, we've, we've definitely seen, haven't we, in the last 12 months, a real step change and a, and a, a real willingness to collaborate across um, services. And we've had some really um, positive examples of this, particularly in this area, I think, of housing, substance misuse and mental health. And I'm very fortunate because I've got the substance misuse and the mental health teams, um, the responsibility within Marsh Government. It's been a real... Um, you know, it, it's been really positive to be able to, 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 to do what we can to bring those together. Although I will say that we are very clear that, that um, the situation is not perfect and there's still quite a lot, a lot um, to do. Um, but definitely COVID, one of the, it's not a silver lining, I don't think it can ever be described as that, but one of the um, positives has been the way in which services um, as have resulted really in the innovation and service improvements that we've seen there. And so I think I suppose the summary from that slide is that the trick now is, is, is not simply to snap back into old or outdated ways of working, um, but to build really on, on the innovation that we've seen and the, the join up that we've seen. And, and the Welsh Government of course must play its part um, in that. Um, so moving on to slide that was just to touch really briefly on um, uh, the kind of complex needs I think it's, it's headed. Um, and that's just um, talking about demand, really, because I think there's no one on this call that is not going to understand um, the complexity of, of, of the people um, that we're trying to, to help, really. So um, in terms of overall demand for substance misuse and mental health, um, we saw a dip actually in referrals early on in the um, pandemic, but they are, are definitely um, uh, increasing now. And certainly on the mental health side, there are certain pockets, CAMS uh, would be one, but there, there are certain pockets where not only are referrals back to pre-COVID levels, but of course we're all very worried that the impact of COVID will mean that referrals, that, that the demand rather will increase um, very significantly, so that's certainly occupying uh, lots of thought um, at the moment. Um, in terms of the type of demand that's coming through, um, obviously uh, what, what the Minister for Mental Health and, and has been considering is that while there'll always be, uh, sadly, a demand for inpatient and specialist services, um, she certainly, Elinid Morgan, has been really keen that we um, 
significantly increase the support for lower level um, tier zero type services. Um, because I think we're recognising and our modelling is showing that is that is that that's the kind of area and focus where we will need to continue to strengthen really the offer uh, that's available. And that's certainly one of the main priorities now um, uh, moving, moving forward. And those are services that are often best provided by the third sector. Um, uh, so, so a definite priority there. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to mention there is that in the context of kind of operating uh, in, in this new normal, um, is an increase really, and we've accelerated the work that we do on sector-wide trauma-informed services. So um, there's a real opportunity there, I think, to support um, you know entrenched, often chaotic service users um, to engage with services that are trauma-informed. And then with the introduction of things like Bovidol, uh, Bovidol, hopefully that presents a new and innovative treatment solution for those um, individuals. Um, so just, I suppose, in summary on that slide, slide I'd summarise it as a bit of a mixed picture, really, of ensuring that our services are reaching those who have the most complex need. We've had, definitely had some successes during the early stages of the pandemic, but we, we clearly need to focus on um, this as an area moving, moving forward, given what we expect COVID uh, how we expect COVID to impact in terms of the economy and all of the other repercussions to come. Um, I'm almost there, I think, Katie. Uh, um, I'm just going to look at the funding. Yes, the funding slide, which is slide seven, talks about the additional funding that was made available for this group. So that's the £1 million um, funding that came out of the mental health pot towards this. And just to confirm, really, that that money is, is still available in 2020-22, because it was included as part of the Welsh Government budget. Um, slide eight, which I think is more or less the last slide, um, is, is just finally, really, to summarise, really, that the um, priority for both mental health and substance misuse delivery plans were both refreshed very recently in light of COVID. And I suppose I just wanted to confirm, really, that this is an agenda that will remain a key priority in both plans, as well as the further work that we need to do on the co-occurring mental health substance misuse um, agenda. So I think, Katie, in terms of, because of time uh, and, and so on, I probably will need to kind of um, wrap my contribution up. Uh, at this point, but just really very happy to pick up any any issues following the conference or have a conversation. And I'm so sorry that my IT has been so poor. No worries at all. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy, for persevering. Um, we know you've got a very busy uh, diary, so we're very grateful for you making the time today and persevering right. with the technology. Um, so uh, that that was great. Um, we got there eventually, didn't we? So uh, we, we heard um, uh, perspective strategically from uh, Tracy from Welsh Government about the the measures that the Welsh Government have taken to uh, ensure that uh, there's a strategic joined up approach both before this pandemic, but importantly during it. Um, and we've also uh, heard from Graham and Ed um, about the brilliant work that they're doing in partnership with with key housing and uh, support and mental health and, and, and substance misuse services up in North Wales. Um, we do have uh, one question, which I hope to pose to Ed and Graham before um, we finish the session. And I don't expect you to have all the answers, but I, I, I want to make sure that we, we that we raise the point that's been raised by someone in the audience. Um, and maybe you could reflect on how you would address this within, within your services. Um, so someone said, uh, people are still being told that they have a substance misuse issue and therefore don't need mental health support. We're also seeing a, a lack of understanding and recognising the impact of trauma on someone's mental health, and the need for specialist services and their experiences that many people are turned away. What changes do you hope to bring um, through some of the work that you've been doing with the, with the partners in North Wales to try and change that experience that some people have um, of services? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's Sorry about that. My, my, um... Got a few IT difficulties here. I think for us, um, certainly one of the um, something that we've noticed is across the board. Really, there's a, a misunderstanding very often about um, mental health. Um, 
And certainly we've learned a lot in terms of what people expect of mental health services. And um, it, it, the benefit to us has been that we've been able to provide signposting and some education to um, not only service users, but also um, other agencies that we're working with. And in some cases that, that can be, um, there's a lot of presumption made um, that people know about these things. And what we find is that very often um, they, they may not be 100% uh, accurate in what they believe and where they send people to for these, uh, for mental health um, issues. So for us, it's been fantastic in that we've been able to identify um, some, some learning needs, if you like, from different agencies and ourselves. And we've been able to um, build relationships with um, other agencies and the mental health teams to see what they can actually provide, how they can provide it, how we can ease access to those. So it, it's been a, I think, to summarise, it's certainly it's been a big learning exercise for everyone and um, managing expectation and on the back of that providing as ed said really being able to fill the gaps whilst we're able to get people into services providing that support to make sure that they don't fall through the, uh, the gap in the meantime really and that's what we're all about is providing the support to make sure that we we keep them safe and we're able to monitor their situation so that we can if need be, we can get them into more urgent services. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Ed. Yeah, sorry. Just just following on from what Graham said, I think it's um, there's a difference between mental well-being and mental health, and I think that's that's become apparent, uh, particularly with a lot of the referrals that we get in on the ground. Um, and like Graham said, it's been a, a massive learning curve for us and a lot of the team none of the team are mental health specialists but they are able to support mental well-being and like Graham says what we can do and what the team does do regularly is um, I've just had confirmation today that because one of my uh, service users has now stopped drinking and he has been abstinent for a number of uh, for a couple of months now he's now able to re-engage with the mental health team but we've supported him in those two months to be able to now re-engage with community mental health um, by looking after his mental well-being. Mm. So it's it's allowing the people that are referring in to get a greater understanding of that difference. And we're learning as we go along, we're, we're becoming much better at it. Um, so we can signpost people in the right place and as Graham said, support them in that process whilst the specialist services then engage so we're filling that because they're, they're swamps like it's already mentioned um you know cams particularly a swamp community mental health help here in north wales are as well uh, most of them are and there are waiting lists they're considerably long waiting so unless you're prioritized you and substance misuse services look at 12 15 weeks mm -hmm. so in those three months we, we've got to give them some care we've got to look after them whilst they get engaged you know and support them in that process Absolutely. Thanks very much, both. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you say is absolutely right, that there's benefits of integrated partnership approaches for the person using that service. But the knock on effect of that learning from all the agencies involved a little bit more about what the other agencies do, what their parameters are, what what is possible, what, you know, to do together. I think that's really, really important. And and certainly, you know, thinking about some of the the, the project that, that you're involved in, but also some of the phase two projects where we've got, you know, mental health and substance misuse specialists working within homelessness teams as well um, where people are able to get that direct support without having to go on waiting lists or at least do that interim support to help people get through that interim period until they do get to the top of the waiting list and I think we're going to have to continue to be creative and innovative and work in partnership to try and make sure that people get that support that they need. Well thank you both. Um, Really, really appreciate you taking the time out. As I said, I know you must be really busy with your day job, um, but I know that everyone will have really benefited from hearing about the approach that you've taken in North Wales. And one of the things that we're really passionate about is sharing some of the good practice across Wales. So we really, really appreciate the time that you've taken out to talk us through that. Um, we've got a discussion topic on the community pages of the Hoover platform. So if any attendees want to continue discussing this issue, want to give any feedback that we can pass on to Tracy and her team, please do 
get involved in the community section of Hoover, find the discussion topic on integrating homelessness, mental health and substance misuse issues, and we'll make sure that that feedback gets passed on to Welsh Government. Um, thank you very much, Ed and Graham, and to Tracy, who I think has left us but persevered um, to get here in the end. We're really, really grateful. It's been a really informative, stimulating session. Um, we're going to leave the session now, um, but for those of you who are interested in learning more about asset coaches and critical time interventions, uh, we'll be kicking off um, the our next session in about seven minutes um, so go back to the agenda click back on into that session and we'll see you all there for the final session of the day thank you very much to you and Marianne. thank you very much Graham and Ed um, and we'll see everyone soon thank you thank you, thank you.